It's Christmas 2010 and I'm one of an army of journalists telling Britain of a troubling missing person story. Landscape architect Joanna Yates has not been seen missing for eight days. It seems she simply vanished into thin air after a night out in Bristol with workmates. She hadn't done this before. There didn't appear to be any personal issues that she had that would mean that she would walk away from home and not tell anybody. He heard her phone ringing in her jacket pocket and that was the start of his nightmare. There was no sign of forced entry. It was somebody that she either knew or recognised. Police suspect the answer lies with someone close to home. But who? They were fully convinced that he had nothing to do with it, that he was innocent. He was looking at sites of violent pornography, the degrading of women, often sort of sadomasochistic practices, including strangulation. In Killer Britain, we bring you a story which put journalism on trial, as well, eventually, as a murderer. Generally happy, buoyant, very, very positive. Joanna and Greg had recently moved to a basement flat in the attractive suburb of Clifton. Their landlord was Christopher Jeffries, a retired English teacher. Never married, he now lived alone. And usually he had no television. He preferred to spend his time buried in one of the hundreds of books that lined his flat, a flat which was directly above Joe and Greg's. I had come to a point where one of the flats that I let out um, for retirement income became vacant. Uh, and the, the very first day that it was advertised, uh, two of the prospective tenants turned out to be Joe Yates and Greg Reardon. I liked them very much. Absolutely nothing at all about them which was unattractive. Um, I liked both of them. They were young, enthusiastic, anxious to set up home together for the first time and I was very pleased to be able to give them the opportunity to do exactly that in what they obviously thought was an ideal place for them. I think both of them were enjoying building a house together, mm. now acquiring the bits and pieces. Um, what young uh, couples do. Yeah. yeah. and. Uh, they're very much a, 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 you know, a partnership, they're very much together, they're, uh, they're very happy together. Another tenant in the converted Victorian villa was Vincent Tabak, a young Dutchman, also working his way up the career ladder. He left Holland for Britain after studying in Eindhoven. His expertise was in the field of people flow in public spaces, how people gather and move. It's a specialised skill much in demand in Britain. He grew up in a rural area of southern Holland. Uden is a very small town uh, in the south of the Netherlands, very quiet, typical southern town. He was this normal kid, really. He didn't have a lot of friends, we know this, that he didn't, he didn't, he played alone a lot of the times. Neighbours remember Vincent Tabak as a quiet, pleasant, somewhat private boy, the youngest of four children. Just an ordinary guy, as yeah, 100 other guys <laughs> can be. A little bit introvert uh, to himself. Uh, yeah, I would say introvert, yes. Vincent left home in his teens to become a student at the Eindhoven University of Technology. Methodical, painstaking, tenacious when it came to problem solving, he quickly made his mark as an excellent student. No mean feat in a university frequently ranked one of the best in the world. Eindhoven is officially the smartest region in the world and Vincent Tabak was one of the smart people. We know Vincent Tabak is a highly intelligent individual, that he's systematic in his approach to life. Vincent Tabak was not perhaps that unusual in the amount of time he spent in front of a computer screen. 
But those who knew him suspected he was as comfortable in the virtual world as the real one, perhaps even more so. Professionally for work, he was a habitual user of the internet, as are many professional people. He used the internet to keep in contact with his girlfriend regularly. In fact, Tabak's real-world persona seemed to vary depending on who he was talking to. He had always struck me and I think struck everybody else in the building as a thoroughly civilised and courteous person. He was a tenant who was in many ways ideal. It seems to be that different people describe him in quite different ways. So his family at home seem to describe him as being quite shy, steady, calm, whereas his Work colleagues in this country seem to describe him as being more outgoing, and these things are quite inconsistent. On the evening of the 17th of December 2010, Vincent Tabak's movements mirrored those of his next door neighbour, Joanna Yates. Just as she waved off boyfriend Greg and headed to the pub, Tabak was also kissing his girlfriend goodbye. Vincent Tabak had also been at work. His partner, Tanya, had gone out to an office function that had taken her out of Bristol. And the plan was that he was going to pick her up in the early hours of the Saturday morning. He later told friends that he'd taken the opportunity to take photographs of the picturesque streets of Bristol, which lay under a blanket of heavy snow. In the meantime, at the Ram pub, a carefree Joe Yates was the life and soul of the party. Everyone that knew Jo absolutely loved her. She was um, just full of life and energy. After a couple of hours, Jo prepared to leave. At home in Canning Road, in the flat next door to hers, Vincent Tabak was eating a pizza, drinking a beer. He responded to an earlier text message from his girlfriend, Tanya, writing, Love you too. Hopefully party is more lively. Just got home. Missing you. Leaving the pub, Joanna started along Queen's Road in the direction of home, looking to buy something for dinner on the way. At ten past eight, she stopped at Waitrose, but didn't buy anything. At 8.29, she paid for two bottles of cider at Bargain Booze on Regent Street. In CCTV footage from the store, she looks happy and relaxed. Later, these mundane details captured on camera would be vitally important as police pieced Joe's evening together. At 8.39, she entered Tesco on Regent Street, where, coincidentally, she also bought a pizza. Later that evening, Vincent Tabak was also caught on CCTV shopping for groceries. He formed an intention at some stage in that evening to go out to Asda. I frankly found that a bit weird and he bought one or two items and some rock salt. Asda was in Bedminster. It's a car drive away from the flat. There are plenty of shops in Clifton. If you needed to pop out for something, I would have expected somebody to go locally, especially given the weather conditions. When Vincent returned home, he opened his laptop. After checking work emails, he entered a virtual world no one in his life knew about. Clearly, if you scrape beneath the surface, there was something about Vincent Tabak and his character and what he enjoyed viewing and doing that other people weren't aware of. He was looking at sites of violent pornography, um, the degrading of women, um, often sort of sadomasochistic practices, um, including strangulation. We also know that when he was away from home, when he was in America and more on a trip that he had in Newcastle, that he looked for escorts. That Friday evening, he was alone. All of us who remember the unfolding story of Joanna Yates' disappearance were struck by the very different characters all living under one roof. The eccentric, bookish academic, the lively, ambitious landscape architect, the reserved Dutchman who was leading a secret online life. Their lives were about to become inextricably and tragically linked. You already started to think there's something not right with this and this could be a criminal investigation. Something has happened to Joe. The only thing with Joe's which wasn't in effect was Joe herself.
Superfix Black Friday app exclusive deals are now live with a new deal every day. Download and shop the app now. Deals end Sunday. Personalized gifts under forty pounds. Betsy has it. This is Sky Glass, the TV that can find anything using just your voice. Really? Yeah. Watch this. Just say Margot Robbie, and there she is. It searches all your apps and channels at once. What? I just have to say it. Exactly. But what if we don't know what we want to watch? But we know we want it to be funny. Just say Find Me Comedy. It can find anything. Find Me Paw Patrol. No problem. Look, there's loads to choose from. That's smart. No, it's smarter. Sky Glass, smarter than a smart TV. Staying with family in Sheffield, 27-year-old architect Greg Reardon tried to get in touch with his girlfriend, Joe Yates. Arriving in Sheffield at 10.30pm on Friday the 17th of December 2010, he sent her a message. Made it okay. Good traffic. Did you have a good time in the pub? He got no response. This was completely out of character for Joe. Now over the weekend he tried to contact her. He tried to text her. He sent text messages to her. He also rang her number and he rang the landline and hadn't got any response. When Greg got back to the flat on the Sunday, Joe wasn't there um, and he tried to contact her. He heard her phone ringing in her jacket pocket. And I suspect that was probably the start of his nightmare. The mobile phone went quite near midnight and Greg's name flashed up on it, which I thought was unusual. And uh, then he said, is Joe with you? And we said, well, no, why would she be with us? And then he said, well, all her belongings are here, her purse, her keys and things like that. I got up on the Monday morning, noticed that I had a missed call on my phone from Greg at about half past twelve on the Sunday, so that was very, very unusual. There was no rationale to it, and so we decided then that we'd drive down to Bristol and we um, asked Greg to phone the police immediately. And in the early hours of the following morning, as far as I can remember, he made the phone call to the police to say that his partner Joe was missing. Greg had already gone through the bag that she, that she used to carry around and then found Joe's wallet, glasses, everything really. The only person, the only thing of Joe's which wasn't in the flat was Joe herself. When she arrived at the flat, what struck Joe's mother, Teresa, was that she immediately came across a receipt showing that her daughter had bought a pizza earlier on the Friday night. But there was no evidence of the pizza in the flat. There was no packaging or the fact that her boots were left in the flat and her coat was there, her keys, her purse, her phone. So you already started to think there's something not right with this and this could be a criminal investigation, something has happened to Joe. We walked around the block just to sort of looking over walls to see either, either the pizza or something to do with Joe or her clothes. And I remember sort of banging on boots of cars as well, just in case she'd been abducted and, and locked in. I mean, I knew there'd be no hope because it was so cold, but I, it's just not knowing what to do. It was a bitterly cold night in Bristol. Temperatures fell to minus eight degrees, and there were several inches of snow on the ground. As David and Teresa Yates searched outside the Canning Road property for their daughter, they came across her neighbour, Vincent, and his girlfriend. I noticed these footprints going diagonally across the lawn, and I wondered where these came from. And I saw these two people, a shorter person and a taller person, 
walking along the same path, and I thought, ah, oh, they must have been the ones that caused it. As I was going into the flat, it stopped, and the smaller person was Tanya, and she asked if she could help. And uh, the man stood well back away from things, didn't say anything. When police arrived, they were in little doubt that they were dealing with a serious situation. In the case of Jo, it was highly unusual. She hadn't done this before. There, were, there didn't appear to be any um, personal issues that she had that would mean that she would, she would walk away from home and not tell anybody. She wasn't on any medication of any sort. She didn't have any mental health issues. She didn't have a history of depression. So all of the indicators that sometimes would cause somebody to leave, leave home weren't there. So very early on, there was concerns for her. On Tuesday the 21st of December, a press conference was called. If I had to pick a daughter, I couldn't pick anybody else. Good afternoon. And I miss her terribly. Firstly, can I thank you all for coming here today? I was frantically looking for bits of evidence when we got there. I mean, we pockets, diaries, everything really. Really didn't know what to do, and no point in searching because there's so many areas around there. It's very difficult just sitting inside, waiting, 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 and not really knowing what was happening in the background. As is routine in an investigation of this kind, the other residents of 44 Canning Road were the first people that detectives wanted to speak to like landlord Chris Jeffries, who held keys to Joe's flat. I came much more into contact with the police um, because I'm also the uh, secretary of the management company for the, for the whole building. Um, and there was a great deal to do in making sure that they had access to all the flats, including the flats uh, where the owners were not there um, at the time. Um, so, yes, I was rather preoccupied with their requirements. But all Chris Jeffries could tell police officers was that on the night Joe was last seen, he'd been alone in his flat reading. He had no idea at this point that this wasn't the end of the police's interest in him. In the meantime, Joe's parents visited her next door neighbours, Vincent Tabak and Tanya Mawson. She was very kind and she said, yeah. is there anything I can do? Can we... I think she said, oh, I don't know if she'll say we, but anyway, he definitely took a step back as far as he could get mm. from the doorway. Vincent Tabak was very unusual. He was very organised, very calm and very rational in that he's not caught up in the horror of the moment as everyone else would be. Vincent Tabak was spoken to for the first time by the police as a result of that call when they came round to take details, treating it, as it was at that time, as a missing person inquiry. Tabak may have professed to know nothing about Joe's disappearance, but he certainly enjoyed talking about it. Those who were close to Vincent Tabak, whether it was Tanya, whether it was work colleagues, whether, whether it was friends, there were friends that they met at dinner parties, you know, he convinced those that he had little or no knowledge of Joe that he knew nothing about her disappearance or her death. And he portrayed this image as actually, he was a bit of a victim himself in that, you know, he was under stress and, and he was concerned and he was doing his utmost to reassure Tanya. We know through emails between the two of them that he was trying to reassure her. And there was one instance of one dinner party when some of the female guests there were, were concerned about walking home and he walked them home. He went back to work on the Monday he was talking to people about the disappearance of his neighbour. Now, Vincent Tabak had left the Bristol area at the end of the 23rd of December. As already arranged, he and Tanya um, travel um, up country to Cambridge uh, to have Christmas with her parents. And then on the 28th of December, he left the UK and travel to the Netherlands through the Channel Tunnel. Anyone in the UK that Christmas will remember the story of Joanna Yates' disappearance as it unfolded on television and in the papers. It felt like the public was collectively praying for positive news. 
Police continue the search for missing landscape architect Joanna Yates. The 25-year-old has not been seen since last Friday. Police are treating the case as a missing persons inquiry to increasingly concern for her whereabouts. We felt we were in a bubble. The whole world was sort of doing things, you know. Christmas well, it was Christmas seven. Day, isn't it, you know? It was about quarter to nine on Christmas Day morning. Uh, Mr and Mrs Birch were walking their dog in Longwood Lane and there was a, if I describe it as a mound underneath the snow um, by, by a wall um, with a quarry on the other side of the wall. And I think they walked past once and it was just something that wasn't quite right and they went back again and they could see I think an area of the jeans, Joe's jeans, exposed and thought is, I think that's a, that's a body of a human. Then we got the call on, on Christmas Day saying, you know, from the police saying, you know, Joe's body has been found, etc. It was relief because we were absolutely certain by this time that Joe was no longer alive. I think I would probably have spent quite a lot of time just looking. I think I would have possibly got a bit obsessive about it. Um, I don't know. I'm glad I wasn't in that position, really. No. The thing, when Joe's body had been found, it clarified a lot of things because Joe hadn't been sexually attacked. Well, it became a murder inquiry from that day yeah. because they knew how she... She hadn't just died. No. They knew she'd been strangled. Yeah. Eight days after she was last seen alive, Joanna Yates' body had been found in Longwood Lane in the village of Fayland, just an eight-minute drive from her flat. We all remember the news that Christmas Day when police revealed that the search for the missing woman had ended in heartbreak for her friends and family. The frozen condition of Joe's body when it was found meant there was a delay to the post-mortem. Three days later, police were able to reveal that she died by compression of the neck. In other words, strangulation. One thing he did do was make contact with the police while he was out of the country. I certainly cannot say that um, I saw Joanna Yates that evening, no. He kept in contact with his partner and sent what is now a particularly pertinent text to her at a time when Joe would have been dead. Sometime after arriving home on Friday the 17th of December 2010, Joanna Yates had been murdered, strangled to death. Detectives investigating the crime quickly established some key facts. Joe was attacked by somebody that she had let into the premises. There was no sign of forced entry. It was somebody that she either knew or recognised. Chris Jeffries had had a conversation that same afternoon with Greg and he would have known that she was going to be there on her own that weekend. He uh, was landlord of the premises and we know he had a spare key. Chris Jeffries became someone of great interest to the British media who'd heard he may have changed his original statement to the police. On the 29th of December, a reporter approached him as he left the house. He didn't immediately recognise that I was the person he was after, but as soon as he did realise that, um, he rather excitedly walked down the drive with me. Are you able to give us any detail of what I'm, it was you told them? I'm afraid not, no. I'm the only person who had any business asking questions that I might be in a position to answer uh, were the police, um, which I made uh, pretty clear to the reporters, probably in a slightly exasperated way. I'm not prepared to make any comments to the media. So you, okay? didn't, you didn't see her that evening? I certainly cannot say that um, I saw Joanna Yates that evening, no. All right. Thank you very much. Christopher Jeffries had not changed his statement. He had added to it. He was trying to be helpful, but had become a person of interest to the police. I believe I had reasonable grounds to arrest Chris Jeffries. So I opened the door um, and was immediately confronted by 
two detectives who showed their ID, um, who announced, we're arresting you on suspicion of the murder of Joe Yates. Following every move of the search and investigation was Vincent Tabak, who, whilst in Holland, trawled the net every day for new details. On the day of Chris Jeffrey's arrest, Tabak also offered some information of his own. One thing he did do was make contact with the police while he was out of the country. And at 10 o'clock that morning, Vincent Tabak and his girlfriend made a telephone call. He rang up with information stating that on the evening of the 17th of December, the person in custody who had a car parked at the rear of that premises in the communal parking area, 44 Cannon Road, their car had moved. That was significant for me as a senior investigator and he knew the relevance of that. Christopher Jeffries had no idea that one of his tenants had incriminated him. His silver Chrysler car was taken away for testing, painstakingly combed for forensic evidence. In the meantime, the bookish, entirely innocent bachelor was in custody facing interrogation. I was invited um, to admit that on the particular Friday evening on which uh, Jo was thought to have disappeared, I had gone round to her flat, I had let myself in because as a landlord I had a key and that um, everything had then um, escalated from that point. This is Sky Glass, the TV that can find anything using just your voice. Really? Yeah, watch this. Just say Margot Robbie. And there she is. It searches all your apps and channels at once. What? I just have to say it. Exactly. But what if we don't know what we want to watch? But we know we want it to be funny. Just say Find Me Comedy. It can find anything. Find Me Paw Patrol! No problem. Look, there's loads to choose from. That's smart. No, it's smarter. Sky Glass, smarter than a smart TV. Black Friday app exclusive deals are now live with a new deal every day. Download and shop the app now. Deals end Sunday. It was so intense as to be quite numbing. All the possessions that I had with me were taken away. He told police he'd stayed in reading that night. Would they find? that he lied. I remember saying, what evidence do you have? I might have begun emotionally to, to break down. The conditions of being held in a police station are extremely stressful. Friends organized legal support as Chris endured three days of questioning and spent two nights in a cell. It was an unimaginable ordeal. Innocent of any crime, Chris Jeffries was released without charge. On New Year's Day 2011, a dangerous killer was still on the loose. Towards the end of the questioning, um, when it became clear that the police were not going to be able to find any ed evidence at all to charge me, then I did start to think, well, a lot of time has been wasted on an innocent person. Uh, whoever was responsible for Joe's disappearance and murder is still on the loose and remains a danger to the public. We, the British public, had been gripped by this developing story with its many twists and turns. But in Holland, it was not a significant news story. 
Then Bristol police decided it was time to speak to the man who'd made a damning but false statement against Chris Jeffries and who had also been alone at 44 Canning Road the night that Joe disappeared. So I sent a team to investigate us out to the Netherlands to speak to him and his girlfriend as a witness to capture that information because I felt that was crucial to my investigation. At that meeting, one thing the police officers asked for was a voluntary DNA sample from Vincent Tabak. He was somewhat reluctant to do so, sufficiently reluctant for the officer who took the sample actually to phone the incident room in Bristol and report that reluctance as being something that concerned her. It wasn't quite right. It wasn't until the officers returned from the Netherlands and they spoke to Vincent de Back on New Year's Eve, that Karen Thomas, uh, the officer that spoke to Vincent de Back and took the statement from him, raised some concerns. Tamak's movements the night of the 17th of December didn't altogether make sense. The walk to take photos of the snow and detectives couldn't find any sign that he'd actually taken any. The car journey to a supermarket some miles away. But there was more. The police, having had his DNA sample obtained voluntarily in Holland and checked against um, findings on Joe's body, discovered that his DNA was on her body. And that was one of the key factors that led to the planned arrest of him in later January. Vincent Tabak was arrested on the 20th of January 2011 on suspicion of murdering Joanna Yates. But there was one person who struggled to believe Tabak could be guilty. His landlord, the innocent man who'd found himself wrongly suspected of murder and seen his face plastered over the newspapers. When Vincent was arrested, I was very surprised indeed because he certainly didn't strike me as somebody who um, I would suspect and I had some concern for him because I was worried that perhaps the police had made another mistake and somebody else had been unjustly um, taken into custody. In Holland, TV news reports detailed his arrest. Journalists there wondered if Tabak could be the victim of a grave miscarriage of justice, fueled by the frenzied British media. Dutch people were saying on internet forums, you know, if you would read that, they were saying, um, uh, well, he might be innocent. Uh, they arrested the landlord and he was innocent too. Uh, maybe the police are under a lot of pressure. You know, there, were, there was a lot of speculation going on and a lot of disbelief going on, a lot, a lot of doubt going on in the Netherlands about this man's guilt, yes. British press besieged Tabak's family in his hometown of Uden. Convinced the man they knew and loved was innocent, they worried that a sensationalist media might prejudice any future jury against Vincent by focusing their attention so heavily on him. They were already under a lot of pressure because they didn't really understand why Vincent Tabak had been arrested. They didn't know anything about it. And of course they believed uh, their brother and their son to be innocent. They even went on television and claimed it. And it was just a, a British media circus around them that they weren't used to and that certainly Holland is not used to. It was seven o'clock in the morning live. Exactly. One of the, the targets we had was to get the British press away from their houses, from their gardens, from their children as they were in Holland already um, very massively. As the British media dug into Vincent's life and background, his family steadfastly stuck by him. There was no way this clever, dedicated young man was a killer. They were fully convinced that he had nothing to do with it, that he was innocent. They knew him very well. He was uh, a very loving uh, brother and son and, and uncle. And for that reason, they were really in distress. I mean, they could not imagine that a guy like him was arrested by the, by the British police for a, a horrific thing like this. In any case, he had his digital alibi, the text messages he'd sent girlfriend Tanya throughout the evening. 
At 9.25, miss you loads. It's boring here without you. At 10.30, can't wait to pick you up. Surely a man who'd committed murder couldn't be so cool, so calm as to send those messages. In custody, Vincent Tabak refused to help police with their inquiries. When he was in custody, he made no comment. And initially when he was in custody, we had the forensic evidence, the DNA that I spoke about on her body, and the statement that he'd made to the police on the, on the 31st of December. He went no comment, but he gave a written statement, during which he stated that he didn't know Joanna Yates didn't know anything about her murder. Police needed to gather more evidence. They began to comb footage from every street camera in Bristol, building a picture of Tabak's every move. They found him walking the streets earlier in the evening. Nothing so odd about that. But at 10.30 p.m., his movements started to make less sense. He walked into a supermarket, then immediately back out again. He inexplicably returned a moment later, entered the store and bought beer, rock salt and crisps. Let's not forget Tabak knows all about the design of public spaces. It's his area of expertise. He knows where cameras are situated, which way they're pointing. Police would come to wonder if he was deliberately making sure that he was caught on camera. My view was that he made that trip to Asda to form an alibi if he needed it. An alibi for why his car was out. A route that he took where there was a lot of CCTV. The fact that he was making a text message underneath a CCTV camera. These were all things to put him out and about as an alibi. He kept in contact with his partner and sent what is now a particularly pertinent text to her at a time when Joe would have been dead. After Tabak's arrest, forensic computer analysts scoured his computer. More and more, he began to look like a man with secrets, with a virtual life he didn't share with his loved ones. Well, there was um, a substantial amount of material found on uh, Vincent's laptop, um, which contained um, extreme pornography. Searches of his computer also uncovered a deep fascination with Joanna Yates' disappearance and the subsequent investigation into her death. Very soon we identified that as early as the 19th of December at 10.30 that evening, he was on Google Maps at home on his laptop looking at Longwood Lane. What it showed was that he had an interest in the situation at a time when um, everybody else, Joe's family, partner and the police were still treating this as a missing person inquiry. On the 21st of January, police were given more time to hold Vincent Tabak for questioning. They needed it. The earlier DNA match linked him to Joanna's body, but was not conclusive enough to charge him. They needed a breakthrough or they'd have to release him. An intense forensic search of Tabak's grey Renault Megane car finally yielded the results they needed. One of the CSIs identified some microscopic areas of blood in the boot of that car. They were swabbed and they were sent to the laboratory. And the DNA contributed to that blood was Joanna Yates. When he was subsequently challenged for the interview process and we disclosed the forensic evidence linking him to her body, he still went no comment. And the initial indications from the computer of what he'd been viewing, then clearly the evidential case was even stronger. And he was in a very difficult position then, but he still chose to say nothing. Vincent Tabak stubbornly refused to acknowledge any part in what had happened to Joanna Yates. Then one day, having spent almost three weeks in custody, he had a change of heart. When he was on remand at uh, Long Larton Prison, on the 8th of February, he disclosed to a, a chaplain at the prison that he was going to plead guilty to the killing of Joe. He may have now admitted killing Joe, but he had not confessed to her murder. In fact, police discovered that prior to his arrest, he'd made some revealing internet searches about the nuances of English law. He was already devising a plan for how he could get off with a lesser offence. 
and he was researching, both at work and on his personal laptop, the differences between murder and manslaughter. Days before he was arrested, Vincent Tabak had begun planning that if the case came to court, he would argue that he killed Joanna Yates by accident. We felt we was, he was trying it on. He, he, I think he felt that, um, well, with the cost cutting, that goes, you know, hearing about the newspapers and so forth, they'd take the easy option in jail for a few years. We had nothing to lose. He, he had nothing to lose by it. Um, because the evidence that the police had, the DNA evidence, um, meant that he killed Joe, so he's only admitting what the police knew anyway. The Crown Prosecution Service made the decision to pursue the murder charge, meaning Joanna's family and her boyfriend Greg would endure a complicated trial and hear the killer's version of events from his own mouth for the first time. Would he convince the jury that Joanna's death was a terrible accident? He says she didn't like what he was doing. She screamed. Any trial, particularly a homicide murder trial, when you wait for the verdict of a jury, your heart starts racing. You have a knot in the stomach whilst you're waiting for that verdict. On the 4th of October 2011, the trial began of Vincent Tabak, a Dutch engineer accused of murdering his neighbour, landscape architect Joanna Yates. He denied murder, entering a plea of manslaughter instead. In the defence's opening speech, Mr William Clegg QC told the court that if Joe had only stayed at the pub for one more drink, if Vincent Tabak had gone straight to Asda, as he had intended, then Joe Yates would be alive today. During the course of the trial, he claimed that as he was walking past the kitchen window of flat one, that he saw Joe Yates in the kitchen and that they waved to each other and that she, in some way, had invited him in. But when he was asked to um, show how Joe waved to him from the window, he actually did a wave and not a beckon. I mean, we, he was obviously in the witness box and we watched him. And, uh, and I thought, well, that's, if that ever happened, it's just a wave like that to someone who's walked past the window that you sort of recognise. It wasn't a, a beckon at all. And when he actually did it, he didn't do that. That's what he claimed during the trial. And that she opened the door and he came into the premises. And then they chatted for 10 to 15 minutes in the kitchen. And she made a flirtatious comment to him and he went to try to kiss her. He'd obviously been reading books of some particular type and, or, or been looking at some videos and that's what's happened. And he thought, well, if it happens in the video, then it probably could happen. But I'm sure he's got no experience of trying to... Um, uh, what's the right Inter word? Socially interact with... Socially. with um, women or females or... At that level? I don't think so. He says she uh, didn't like what he was doing. She screamed in order to stop her. He put his hand over her mouth. When he took his hand away, she screamed again. And it's then that he replaced his hand and he strangled her. As he, he claimed, he didn't intend to kill her. He claimed that he panicked. But they weren't the actions of somebody that was panicking. Tabak's defence was that he'd made an advance towards Joe and that it had gone horribly wrong. Would the jury accept his version of events? Would they accept that he was not guilty of murder, but of manslaughter? Any trial, particularly a homicide murder trial, when you wait for the verdict of a jury, your heart starts racing. You have a knot in the stomach whilst you're waiting for that verdict. The jury deliberated for two and a half days. It must have been an agonising wait for Joe's loved ones, as well as the professionals who'd worked so hard to bring Tabak to justice. Certainly there was a tenseness at the time as the jury came to a decision on a story we'd all followed from the first moment that Joe was reported missing. On the 28th of October 2011, the jury at Bristol Crown Court returned. They rejected Tabak's defence and found him guilty of the murder of Joanna Yates. He was sentenced to life with a minimum tariff of 20 years. But the important thing was the tag of murderer rather than manslaughter. Murder is quite specific. 
Manslaughter is sort of ambiguous. There was nothing ambiguous about what Vincent Tabak had done. He put a hand around her throat and he squeezed and he squeezed the life out of her. To some experts, Vincent Tabak showed signs of being a serial killer in the making. He does present a very unusual profile to be a one offence killer when he is this organised and this systematic and this apparently um, emotionally disconnected from the tragedy that he has caused. It must have planned it. Not necessarily with Joe, but it had this plan in his head and then the opportunity arose. In the short time she'd lived at 44 Canning Road, Joanna had planted a mini garden outside her flat. One resident still tends to the flowers and herbs that she will never see. She was just a lovely girl. We could um, spend time together and not talk and be really happy or just chatter away. And I do miss her. And hopefully, um, when I think of her, I'll be able to be happier, but currently I haven't got through to that bit yet. Our grief really is towards what was taken away from her, not, not what we've lost, but what was taken away from her, because she put a lot of sacrifices to achieve what she had done. And I just wish that she had a chance to sort of reap the benefits of what she put together. She was a delightful girl, an absolute delight, and it's very difficult to think that you're never going to see this person, you're never going to hear this person's voice, and all that you've got to remember them by is what, they, what exists at the moment, and there's nothing for tomorrow. And um, that's, very, that's very difficult. The story of innocent Christopher Jeffries went on to be made into a major British TV drama. Meanwhile, left to cope with the agony that they'd suffered to Anna's devastated parents. For Teresa and David Yates, they will forever miss a young woman who clearly brought light into the lives of everyone who knew her. I think she always, she'd always say to anybody who had any problems, it'll be fine. And that was it, it'll be fine. Yeah. That's all, that's all that um, I think most people needed to hear from Joe. They had confidence <laughs> that it would be fine, it would be all right. Yeah.